Welcome to Knowledgeable Aging. I'm your host, Jason Kotar. Joining us today to talk about how to be a good listener is Janice Willett. Janice is a pastoral care chaplain and Amazon International number one best-selling author of the God-inspired book, Affairs of the Heart, and the insightful book, Dying Without Crying. Janice writes books that bring peace and comfort to so many. She also speaks professionally to encourage and inspire others to become the best version of themselves through forgiveness of self and others. The presented content does not provide or constitute medical, financial, or legal advice. The content is for information purposes only. Viewing or listening to the content does not constitute a physician-patient, dentist-patient, fiduciary-client, or attorney-client relationship. How are you doing today, Janet? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing very good. The snow has finally subsided here in D.C., so you won't find a happier person um, on this webinar. <laughs> uh we're still having a little here and there and some iciness, but uh, yeah, the big the big stuff has um, been plowed away, so I'm thankful for that. Very we'll good. Host here. Very good. Uh, for those that are joining us for the live webinar, if you have any questions, um, I encourage you to type your questions in. Time permitting, we will do everything in our power to get your questions answered. So Janice, I'd like to get started. What does being a good listener mean? You know, Jason, um, it seems there's always information on how to become a better speaker so people will listen, but it's not often that we hear about becoming a better listener so people can speak. Um, intent listening is not like having a regular conversation. In a regular conversation, we will interrupt each other's sentences, uh, offer advice, how to fix it. Um, I had a bad day. Oh, you had a bad day. You should have seen what happened to me, you know, and, and so it goes. But to really listen intently is actually an act of surrender. And in that, we really risk being changed by what we hear. It's about leaving our ego at the door. It's about having no opinions and no judgment. And the judgment part is big because we don't realize um, judgment is not just verbal. Like, oh my gosh, you're kidding me. He said what? You, those type of things. but. It's rolling our eyes, shaking our head, um, and the body language. All of a sudden, we cross our arms. We're putting up a barrier, or we don't like what you're saying, or we'll start turning sideways and just physically say, we're done listening to you. So we have to be very aware with intent listening that our body is facing you, our voice, our tone is calm, it's level, eye contact. Eye contact is so important. And especially um, as a chaplain, when, when folks are lying in bed or sitting in bed, to pull a chair up so that we're level. Uh, we're not speaking up or down to each other. It, with those physical signals, um, the posture relaxed. It, it It's just an art to learn, just like speaking is an art to learn. And uh, another big part is swallowing our pride. Um, back to that vulnerability as a listener. If someone is criticizing us, if something may really hurt us or, or cause us some kind of pain, um, things to hear that we don't want to hear, sometimes the truth can hurt, um, we still need to actively be listening and say nothing and wait until it's our turn if that or when that comes. So Jason is a, a hospital chaplain and spending a lot of time with patients and families to support them. 
And actually this uh, one statement, this definition of what a chaplain is that I once read in a book, um, it's to join another person in their pain and sorrow. No matter what the faith system is or isn't, we meet them where they are at that moment. And that moment keeps changing. So we need to be present in every moment. We're not there to fix. We're not there to rescue. We're not there to agree or to disagree or to judge. We're just there to listen. And I, I found that by active listening, we don't realize what a gift that is to another person to create sacred space that's just about them. It's all about them. It's about their suffering. It's about their feelings. And we're not running away from it. You know, a lot of people don't want to hear bad things or they don't want you to say how bad you feel because it might be true. And, you know, you might say to me, Janice, I, I something wrong. Jason, you're going to be okay. You're, you're going to be okay. You know, just eat, just eat. You're, you'll, don't worry about it. Instead of saying, what are you feeling? What does it feel like? So we have to be there and allow the other person to fall apart. It's okay. It's really okay. Um, we don't say, oh, I understand. I don't understand. Even if I had the same issue as you, you have come from a different background. You're going to deal with things differently than I am. You know, we could both go skydiving and you could say skydiving is the most exhilarating experience in your life. And I may say, don't ever go. It is the most fearful, anxiety induced. I don't know why anybody would ever do that. So no, I don't know how you feel and I, I can't impose that on you. But I may ask you, how do you feel about that? What's important to you right now? What's the hardest thing for you right now? Are there any short or long-term goals you want to consider right now? And then once that is said, just leave a pause. Open spaces of silence are really okay. And most people are very uncomfortable with spaces of silence. So I wouldn't mind sharing a few examples with you, if that's okay, as to listening and remaining neutral in some of the um, environment of the, with patients at the hospital. And again, not correcting, not judging, just letting things unfold. The, um, there was one patient, we'll call him Eric, and um, he had cancer. He eventually passed away, but he was for weeks um, at the end being hospitalized. And when I first met him and I walked in the room, um, I wear a badge and it does say chaplain. And the first thing he said, was, oh, I don't believe in God. You don't need to come in here. And I said, you know, I, I didn't come in here to talk about God. I just came in here today to see how you're doing. And there was quite a pause, but I didn't say anything. And then he said, well, okay, come on in. So I came in the room and I said, so how are you doing? And he started telling me his journey so far and his surgeries and his type of cancer. And all of a sudden he said, you know, I went to Catholic school. And I said, oh, did you? Pause. He said, well, do you want to know why I don't believe in God? I said, sure. He said, well, when it came to us learning the Bible, 
I realized there were no dinosaurs in the Bible. And that was written when there were dinosaurs. So if that wasn't in there, why should I believe it? So I paused and I said, you know, I don't recall dinosaurs in the Bible either. And then he said, oh, and it was, we came to the spot where everything was okay. And we talked more and um, before I left the room, he said, will you pray with me? And I said, sure. So we got to know each other pretty well. And I did visits with him through the end, his last day. And um, we developed that relationship from those pauses and listening and peacefulness. We talked about what it feels like to die, about fears and wishes and short and long-term goals. And um, I will always remember him and I will always miss him. And I will always be thankful that I listened. Um, many times when people are angry, they're the ones that have the best stories that need to come out. And, um, I knew this one long-term patient, um, at one of the nursing homes I would visit and she was a devout Catholic and she always had a very good demeanor. She was happy. She wanted to do a prayer every week. Um, she was in her late 80s. And one day I was doing visits there and I hear the screaming down the hall going to all the stuff and the nurses are going crazy. And I go down there and it's Mary. And I'm thinking, wow, this is out of character. So the staff's frustrated, they leave the room and uh, there's a tray of food uneaten in front of her and she's sitting in her wheelchair. And I said, so what's going on? She said, where's my teeth? I can't find my teeth. She's going screaming. I said, okay, let me, let me take a look. So I found some upper, upper dentures and I got them uh, cleaned and I gave them to her. And then she barked at me, well, where are the lower ones? I said, well, I didn't know that we needed to look for them. So I found them and I got them to her. And then she's still grumbling and she's not eating her food. So I said, so what's really going on? And you know what she said? I'm so mad at God. I said, well, why are you mad at God? She said, well, I've about had it. I don't want to be here anymore. And I keep praying to him to please take me. And he won't do that. And I'm really, really angry about it. So I said, well, do you want to include that in our prayer today? And she said, yes. So together we prayed about how angry she was. And, um, when I went there a few days later to do rounds, Mary had gone and God had listened to what she had to say. And I think one of the most impactful listening, um, if you want to call it an event of listening that I've ever had was with a um, young patient, female, and um, she was very sick. I stopped in her room to say hi, and she started talking to me. And as we were talking, first I was standing, and then she sat on the edge of the bed, and then she had taken my hand to invite me to sit next to her, both of us sitting on the edge of the bed. And during this time, this poor girl, went through how many surgeries, how many illnesses, her time is limited, her siblings were sick, her parents had died, her sick dog needed help, something else, it was non-stop. And she was crying profusely. And as I'm sitting next to her, as this conversation's 
of hers, her speaking, I should say, not conversation, is is having momentum. Our shoulders are touching, and and but we're both facing a wall, not each other. And uh, her head now is leaned onto mine, and I could feel the tears just rolling down my face behind my glasses. And she got all done. And there was just this long silence. And I could feel her head turning to have my face meet hers as our shoulders were touching. And as our faces rolled into each other, she just looked in my eyes and I looked at hers and I said, I don't even know what to say. Do you know she hugged me and thanked me so much for all I had done for her that day? And I did nothing but be right. to be with her yeah um another part i think that is so important to share and one of my quotes is we're all going down the same road we just arrive at different times and uh i have lost both my parents. My my mom had died in 2010 and my father in 2014. Um, and both actually at the hospital where I am a chaplain now and it has a lot of meaning to me. Um, when, when mom was passing, dad kept saying to her, Oh, please, I can't, I don't know what I'm going to do without you. I can't live without you. I can't go on without you. I'm gonna, this was day after day. And one day, and this was before I became a chaplain, um, I said to dad outside the room, you know, I realize how difficult this is for you. They were married such a long time. And um, I said, but I think you need to let mom know that it's okay if she dies that you're going to be okay. And you've got my sister and me here for you and we're going to be okay. We're going to get through it. But mom needs to know that. And he said he didn't know if he could do it, but he did. And you know, years later, he said to me, Janice, I can't thank you enough for what you said when mom was dying and I had forgotten. And he reminded me I, about giving permission and so many people, um, family members, many times have such a hard time hearing and listening to their mom or their dad or their loved one. And their loved one, has they know they're going to die. Some of them have just had it. They've been through rounds of chemo and surgeries. And, but in any case, the patient's ready to go, the loved one. And... The family will not hear it. And it's just so important. Sometimes as chaplains, you know, we we need to have a conversation. You know, the patient will say when the family's not in the room, why won't they hear me? I'm trying to tell them. They, they won't let it go. They keep bringing meatloaf. I don't want to eat. They're trying to force me to drink i don't want to drink i they're not so then we'll have a conversation with the family and say you know this is really tough but i think mom's body has had it and and mom's ready to go and perhaps she would like to talk to you about it you know a lot of people aren't aware that they're not responding to that person and I explain this is like the most intimate conversation you're going to ever have with your mother or your father to go in and really talk about it and you know it does make a difference and people uh, they don't have those regrets they don't have those unfinished sentences anymore they had a real conversation and I think that's just so important to be able to um, understand. Don't don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the elephant in the room. Um, it's also good to be aware that good listening skills don't always have to do with words. 
I do be with the body language. Um, my my one um, aunt, my aunt Eleanor. She was a sweetheart in her 90s, but Aunt Ellie had gotten some strokes and uh, her speech was so slurred, it was very difficult. It's like speaking a foreign language. And then she got wet macular degeneration so badly in her eyes, she became almost blind. She could just see figures. And I had, uh, she had to go in a nursing home the last, uh, short period of time of her life and um, I got a special stuffed animal for her when I picked it out I closed my eyes in the gift shop and I kept feeling everything because I said well if I couldn't see how would this really feel and I found um, a little stuffed animal that felt so good and I gave it to Aunt Ellie and I said to her, every day when I leave, I'm going to put this in your arms and you can feel it and know how much I love you. So she had that and she loved it and she was always holding it when I came to visit and I'd give it back, you know, when I'd leave. And then one day when I was saying goodbye, she handed the stuffed animal to me. And I had to listen intently to what she wasn't saying. And I took it in my arms. And she was trying to be so valiant in her weakness. She had an aide, uh, a female that was a, a caregiver in the room when I wasn't there, that, that they got along so well. And I knew the caregiver would be coming in. I took the animal, I said goodbye, I got to the door. My aunt gave me a wave like a, the queens do, this big wave and this huge smile. And I knew that was goodbye. And I said, goodbye, Aunt Ellie, I love you. And she had it her way, which I heard. She wanted to be with the aide when she passed. So, um, yeah it's good to listen yeah i was wondering if we can talk about your book dying without crying and the role of listening in your book sure um the book is a short book and it has so much to say in such simplicity and it's for the caregiver and the care receiver and the goal is that when we die, both sides have no regret. And it's not just a book on dying without crying this moment, but even to read it when you're well and you're not a caregiver or a care receiver, because it can really change how you move through life and make it richer. And a big part of this book in the beginning is to be heard by your physicians of what your wishes are. Some people don't want a medical intervention and some people don't want these heroic experimental and whatever, and maybe you do, but your voice needs to be heard. And if people aren't listening, you, need to request and when you request if you're still being overridden you need to demand to be listened to that you have a voice and that's with medical staff it's with testing and technicians it's with family it's with friends it's listening to if i'm going to be your caregiver i want to say jason what are your needs? Can we go over? I want to know what you want me to do on a daily basis, whether it's uh, eating, you know, food, times of food, types of food, uh, uh, bathing, what, whatever, medications. Let's go over every. I want to hear what you would like me to do. And uh, for the week, you know, there's different tasks when you want your laundry. You know, too many times we hear 
I don't know what was wrong with him. I did everything for him. I did everything. I cooked, I, I made the sausages, I starched the shirts with. And then you find that the other person said, I, I hated starch shirts. I, I don't want, so all I kept saying was, I only wanted you to sit here with me and watch TV. There's so much, every, people do what they think someone else needs them to do and they're not listening or asking, what is it that you need? What can I do for you? That's what's so important. And it's to be in the now, in the, in, in the present. Um, forget yesterday. You can't unring a bell. It's done, it's gone, and tomorrow's not here. So what do you need today? And we talk about that in the book. And it, it, the fact, again, you don't have to fix it. You just need to listen and to be present. And you, as a caregiver, can also say, you know, that doesn't work for me, but how else can it be done? And this would work with your children, with your spouses. It work if we just would take the time to listen. Yeah. So Janice, how can you encourage somebody to talk? There are so many ways and there are wonderful um things to say to elicit um if someone looks angry you might even say geez you, you just don't seem yourself today Is something going on um how do you feel about it how how are you coping with that what's important to you right now here's a big one how can i support you how can i support you in that um that must be difficult when you say that people that opens another great big door because then they'll say you're right it is and then be able to say more and that's so important to keep that door opening wider and wider so this anger or hurt or sadness whatever it is that i'm holding in you're giving me an opportunity to finally free myself and all you have to do is ask me, or it sounds like you're upset, um, or you seem frustrated. Um, has this ever happened before? What are your goals? Yeah. And um, so also nice to thank someone for inviting them into their space. Yeah. So Janice, obviously with COVID, the ability to see and touch our family members, it's not there like it used to. So what do you encourage people to do when it comes to listening to their family when sometimes it's just a phone call as opposed to being able to, to see the nonverbal when you're, when you're in the room with them? And sometimes it's not even a phone call that they can yeah. have. I encourage to write letters and patients and families have so appreciated that and never even thought of it or doing a a, a voice um you know audio talking everybody talking or a little video but the big thing is when there are no devices not everyone has a device or a phone or can reach it or hold it um letters seem to really be the ticket and cards and um those that are really not doing well and are concerned that they may not get out of the hospital, I encourage them to write their love letters. Yeah. How can you improve your listening skills with family as you get older? Uh, as you get older, that was really good because as we get older, we get more stuck in our ways. <laughs> Right, <laughs> especially uh, couples, you know, they've been together a long time and a little bit of stubbornness and they think they know what the other one thinks and what they need. Um, you know, uh, okay, a scenario. 
someone might say, oh, Edith, my stomach, I have a stomach. Of course you have a stomach ache. Look at what you ate yesterday. No wonder. I told you you should. And even that had absolutely nothing to do with what he was trying to get to me. So again, it goes back to these questions. Don't assume anything. That's our problem. We assume, we assume, we assume that we know what it is that, that you're going to say. We assume we know what you need. I should have said, geez, your stomach hurts. What do you think it is? Oh, my. Or with children. Um, there are things that can happen. There was an instance where there was a toddler that was so excited uh, morning had come and and she knew that the family was going to go on this super fun event at an amusement park later in the day and she when are we going when are we going and the parents said when both hands point up to the 12 we have to be out the door and then everybody went back to their business of filling the hours until it was time and all of a sudden the toddler goes running out the front door the parents are screaming, where are you going? Get back and the toddler's trying to say, what? And every time the toddler goes to speak, the parents are yelling, get to your room. What are you thinking? Don't you ever do that again? You don't run out. And she's going, ah. nobody listened. The tears, the yelling, everybody's upset. Are we even gonna go? And later, do you know what it was? What the toddler was trying to say, if everyone had just said, geez, why did you run out the door? She said, well, when I asked this morning when we were leaving, you told me when both those hands point up to the 12, we better be out the door. And she actually followed directions. Wow. <laughs> Went out the door. Yeah. Very good. Well, this is uh, really good stuff, Janice. So how can people find you? Okay, there are several ways. Um, my name is Janice Willette, but my author name and on social media, I am the initial J dot, the initial I dot. And my last name Willette is W-I-L-L-E-T-T. -T. I chose that author name because I just felt it wasn't important if I were a man or a woman or who I was, it was the book that was important and to make a difference in someone else's life. So my website would be J-I-W-I-L-L-E-T-T.com. And um, my social media, uh, Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, Everything is J at J I Willett. And uh, Amazon also uh, books J dot I dot Willett. That's me. Very good. Uh, as far as knowledgeable aging, all of our webinars will be archived on our website, knowledgeableaging.com. You can also go to our YouTube page, uh, type in knowledgeable aging. We encourage you to subscribe. Uh, we update the YouTube page five to six times per week. If podcasts are your thing, you can find us on Apple Tunes, Spotify, etc. Till next time, I'm your host, Jason Kotar, and this is Knowledgeable Aging.